Thank you so much. That was a very generous introduction. Thanks a lot. So it's my pleasure to be here. Of course, it would be much more pleasure to be in the live, but um, luckily organizers agreed to host me online. I know online conference talks can be quite tiring, but let's hope this one will be a little bit entertaining because we are going to talk about teaching. And um, to begin with, uh, let me try to see. How, uh, yeah. So, and to begin with, I actually want to ask your opinion. Okay, I think I have it here. Yeah. So you can you can join this uh, mainc.com. You can join with, with this with this code. And um, tell me what? How do you feel about teaching? Well, in case you're considering an academic job or you're doing an academic job, uh, like um, I offered you this for categories. Does it work, this Mentimeter? I don't see. Uh, wait a minute. I'm now, oh, sorry, I'm now in PowerPoint. Let me. Hey, let wait me one second that we can access as well. So, yeah, in I case think... somebody cannot see, the yeah. website is menti.com. Use the code 2414 7633. Yes, 2414-1733, yeah. Uh, let's see the results. Okay. Okay. Um, how many people are there in the room? More or less. 13. Oh, okay, all right. So, um, so you see, um, the opinions are divided. And actually, I just was talking to, to Thomas that, um, actually, I, I expect that nobody said it different. Teaching is a subject that doesn't um, leave people indifferent. You may love it or hate it, but nobody has like feels nothing about it and that makes it such an interesting subject and when I start talking about teaching people usually react on that so uh, this introduction was very generous so this uh, I, I just wanted to say a little bit like I work as a professor and I recently started actually in, in a new job at Eindhoven University of Technology before that I was working at the University of Twente for 20 years and this is more or less an overview of what I'm doing um, with my life so um, I'm doing this research and my, my psychoanalysis in this case page rank on a large say social network I teach my courses I'm also passionate about popularization of mathematics I wrote some popular books about some books for general publics, public about mathematics. And of course, I also do work for community, like editorial boards, committees, and etc. And then after doing all this, like this keeps me busy enough. And um, after that, um, on um, in my free time, this is more or less the literature that I'm reading. In my free time, I'm trying to read about education. Because um, I believe that... Um, I believe that I don't know enough about education and I want to do it better and I want to do it right. And many people ask me, like, what, what are you, why are you so worried about this? And why do you want to know so much about this? And why are you so passionate about this? What's wrong with our education? Like, we are doing a great job, right? And I want to show you what problem I, I'm trying to solve. Yeah, by the way, this uh, um, this work is appreciated. So this here I got Teacher of the Year Award from the University of Twente. That was really a big honor for me. That was in 2022. And um, with this award, they showed also some appreciation to the innovative things that I did and that I got through all these books. And then sometimes people ask me, like, but but why? Like, what problem are you trying to solve? So I want to show you what problem I'm trying to solve. And I will show it with an example. So this is an exam. Uh, this is an exam question. It's a course called Linear Structures at the University of Twente. And it's basically linear algebra, linear algebra from, from mathematics. And the question was to compute a volume of a parallelepiped generated by three, three vectors. OK, so prolipipid, of course, as we all know, is this thing. But even that doesn't matter that much. Important for this particular example that we have to compute a volume. We have to compute a volume. And it was a multiple choice question. So this was a possible answers. Now, I didn't prepare my poll for that, but 
you can see like we want to compute the volume so when you look at this list the first thing that comes in your mind is like okay this answers immediately you can exclude right because yeah volume cannot be negative and then you would say well why do you even include this answers as multiple choice answers because like which student in their right mind would choose for these answers and you will be surprised 25 percent of the students chose for this answer and then i know exactly i know exactly why it is happening um so this is a question um and um this is a solution and um the solution is just computing determinant um, of a matrix, three by three matrix with, with these vectors, right? And when they compute this determinant, then what, what they see is that the determinant is negative. But actually, the, the volume is an absolute value of the determinant, so you have to take absolute value. But they see minus six in the list of answers, and they just circle minus six or click on minus six if it's electronic. So, and then and then if you ask a student like okay what is happening like why do you do that um what happened here then most of the students say that was just a stupid mistake and i say okay you know if i was getting like one dollar every time i hear students saying it was just a stupid mistake i would be a very rich lady they say it all the time but honestly i do not believe it's a stupid mistake i don't i believe there is a bigger problem well, first of all, exam is not a very healthy situation. Students are enormous under enormous time pressure, enormous performance pressure. That is what they will say. But what I will say that they actually didn't learn well enough. They didn't learn well enough. And that is the reason why they give answer. And what do I mean by that? I think when you learn, definitely when you learn mathematics, what does it mean that you understand the material it means that you can think critically about the material that's what it means right so this ability to ask yourself questions about the material that is what we actually want to teach right so this is a question and what does it mean thinking critically like for example to begin with when you solve a mathematical problem you have to ask yourself okay what answer can i expect right then after solving the problem you can look at your answer and say does my answer make sense and if students asked any of these two questions at the beginning or at the end they would never choose minus six right but they don't have that habit to ask these questions so they do not have the habit to think about the material crit critically and that means that basically they don't answer the uh, master the material they just try to automatically parse this uh, guess basically the answers and I think it's not good. I think it's a problem and I think we can do much better. So now, uh, how can we do much better? And for that, I want to pull you again. Um, so this is in PowerPoint, but I'm switching to my uh, Mintimeter again. So my next question is, wait a minute, uh, I hope it will work. Hi. Um, okay. Um, something here is not right. Um, okay. Um, ah, I'm so sorry. Uh, ah, here I think. I think next slide. Yeah. Okay. So now um, here are the fi five factors that may or may not contribute in in the students' learning, and I want to ask you to rank them. Um, actually, I know tried this type of ranking question before, so I hope it will work. Um, so what do you think is the most important? That teacher explains well, or maybe the teacher is charismatic, enthusiastic, or maybe course design, how the course is organized, or maybe that the course is live and not online, or maybe this is what students do, what kind of exercises, assignments they're getting, or maybe it's a study material. So in which order will you rank them? I'm curious. Okay. All right, so um, actually, yeah, let's let's wait a little bit. Let's wait a little bit. Because now only two people answered, yeah? So now we will wait and see how you, um, how you answer. Try to answer because it's good to think about it, you know, because after that you will see um, you participate in a little bit more conscious, <laughs> conscious way. 
Um, okay, six people answered now. All right. Okay, so, but, okay, okay, some competition going on between different things. Okay. All right, so you see, uh, okay, we have a very small pool, of course, but for some time, this teacher explains well, and was the, this was still on the on the first place, and teachers charismatic has been on the second place, and just think about how teacher centric are we, you know. At the beginning, when I started teaching, I was also thinking that it's so important to explain well, and I was trying to explain as well as I could possible as I possibly could. But then I realized, you know. It's actually a very arrogant thought to believe that what students learn depends so much on what I say. This is very teacher centric to put this on the first place. Is it important? Yes, it is important. Like all these things are important, but it's really not what teacher says. It is really what students do uh, is the main factor in, in their learning. So, in fact, if I had to rank now and not 20 years ago, then I would rank this course design and students' activities as hires. While my own choice of words, I probably would not rank so high um, at this moment. So, and why is this? Why my opinion changed about that? And um, what actually is important. So this is uh, like uh, the ranking that, that you presented more or less is what is common wisdom, how common wisdom goes. The common wisdom goes like this. So the teacher explains well, the teacher provides good materials, maybe like books or videos, gives some, some problems to the students, and this is how students learn, and that is how students master the material. But actually, all these books that I'm reading, they are saying that actually is not true, that it is this gears in the students head that have to turn and that really depends on students on what they do and on interaction with them so let me show like okay i have just um, different books say different things but i have parts for myself four most important things um for student learning yeah so basically this this these books they really question this conventional wisdom they say well what we do it just doesn't it doesn't just put knowledge in student heads then what does? So there is this fantastic book that I like very much. Its book actually is um, um, it's actually a neuroscience book. So all these measurements are MRI measurements, and you may ask yourself what conclusions can you make from this uh, on the given classes. But these are the principles that how people actually learn, how people learn effectively. Is the first thing that is needed is engagement. So it is important that students actually do something. They actually learn by doing something, by being active. And in fact, it's like even more important how students explain things to each other than how a teacher explain things. So being active during the learning, doing something is very important. That's the first. Second is very interesting. It is inconsequential error feedback. So what does it mean? It means that students should learn in a natural way for a human being. They should be able to make mistakes, hear out, like see why a mistake was, and correct this mistake and try again. So students need a feedback on their errors and they need also a safe space to make errors. And that's very important to have a safe space. And in that sense, like many people say, oh, exam is a feedback moment, but exam is not a feedback moment. Exam is a, is a testing qualification moment. It's not inconsequential error feedback. You're punished for your mistakes during the exam. And also a grade is not a feedback. You get a number, but what exactly did you do wrong, you know? So it's not right to think about exam as in that setting, inconsequential error feedback means that you have all the freedom to make a mistake, to um, to hear feedback on this and try again. That is inconsequential error feedback. The next part is spacing. So uh, in traditional systems with lectures, tutorials, and exams, students very often cramp for the test, like the last couple of days for the test. 
Well, this is not how human being learn, uh, uh, learns. So um, what happens in our head is that we have this also operational memory. And if we get too much material in one day, it just doesn't fit in our operational memory. And uh, we just cannot learn this um, big material in a short time. So what we need is to learn a little bit, big and small pieces, at regular intervals, and then come back to the previously learned bits and pieces from time to time. So these are the three things. Well, and the fourth one, well, unfortunately, I cannot see you in your faces, uh, but uh, can you try to guess what is the fourth one? Somebody can make a guess what is the fourth one? Don't see you at all, but OK. So the, the fourth one is actually sleep. So students need enough sleep so that the material from operational memory can be transport, transported to uh, long-term memory and that happens well with sleep. And actually it's a long process, also process of making new neural, neural co co connections also happens during the sleep and it's a long process. So actually after learning um, the material for maybe a week or even longer during your sleep, your brain processes this learned material. All right, so this is what we need for learning. And I, of course, you can say the traditional lecture tutorial exam system uh, may have all these elements. Students can be engaged during lecture and ask questions. Students may come to the teacher and ask about their mistakes. Students can learn at regular intervals, and it's up to them how much they sleep. So it's not that this classical system doesn't allow that, but it simply doesn't happen for majority of the students. And maybe, OK, maybe I was learning this way anyway, but you know, that's why I work at university. It's like it's um, judging by my own experience is really a survival bias. Uh, so I cannot do that. I can't apply my own experience for 30, from 30 years ago to current students, you know. OK, so I do it differently. So I use Flip Classroom. I put all my classes in the videos. So these are statistics videos and I have um, I have a YouTube channel for that, and um, and I have also these linear algebra videos, and these little circles are the places where video stops and there is a question, and students can answer questions. So some of these videos I recorded in the studio, some of these videos are pencasts, and it is a lot of work to record videos actually. So to be honest, I believe that uh, videos should be a part of learning material, so that every textbook should come with videos. So. So I put all material on the videos and I try to make these videos very nice. And then in the class, I free space for interaction and for inconsequential error feedback. So in fact, I decided that given lectures is really Lectures is really, really bad way for learning things, you know, um, and not everybody agrees with me. But uh, recently I started this series of articles about innovative teaching and I wanted it is it is a journal for that most mathematicians in the Netherlands read. And um, I thought, OK, how can I call this column so that people actually read it? And I call this column better than Blackboard. I wanted I could call it innovative education. Nobody would ever read. But when they write better than Blackboard, then people are inclined to, to read because it's a little bit controversial. So in my first article in this series was that we shouldn't give classroom lectures anymore because there are so many problems with classroom lectures. Students basically learn nothing. And you can say, OK, um, maybe they don't learn much, but they get some inspiration. But two hours of inspiration, two times per week? I don't know. I, I think um, there are also better ways of getting inspiration, to be honest. So I don't believe it's a good way. So I put all my le uh, lectures on the videos so students can watch in their own time and rewind and so. But in the class, we do something else. So here is, for example, how this linear algebra course looks. So at home, students uh, read the book and watch videos, this fleet classroom setting. And during the class, which I don't like to call lecture, what I do, I use this type, like what I use with you with this Mintimeter question. So I prepare these questions which are a little bit, um, uh, you know, they usually are around common mistakes. For example, every year, each and every year, first year math students, 80% uh, approximately, say that R2 is a subspace of R3, which is of course not true because subspace is a subset to begin with, with and R3 contains elements of length 3 and R2 contains elements of length 2, so they can it can be a subspace. 
but um, that is type of formalities that students have to get used to. And this um, way is a very good way for them to, to confront them with these questions. OK, I watched videos. It was clear enough. So now I come to the class and then you confront these questions and mm, other confront questions and um, you try to answer. And then I have my chance to explain most interesting things you know in the lecture we have to explain a lot of basic things in this class i explain only most interesting things and then uh, they also make quizzes online and then there is another line which i will not uh, tell, in, tell in details but here we teaching them teaching them how to do proofs and basically they have to at home write, write solutions and these solutions have to be complete. So you have to analyze the problem. You have to make a plan. You have to reflect on your answer. But the solution is allowed to be completely wrong. And then they come together and they compare their solutions and they correct the mistakes. And then they submit corrected version. So here and here as well, I have space for inconsequential error feedback because here if they make errors, well, this anonymous quiz and that is exactly made to make errors. and. Um, and here also they can come with their own solution and then discuss in the group and figure out together which solution was correct. It doesn't all work ideal and I don't say that this is how everybody should do it. There are many, many good ways of doing things and uh, I also have students complain about all these innovations. I come back to this, but um, but at least it works. And also then I we actually we, um, we teach what we preach and we also test what we preach because after going doing all this, they get examined two parts and the first part will be online quiz which is very similar to what they already tried without a grade and the second part is a written exam where they have to write two proofs in the same style as they learned here so every week they have one proof here and in the exam they have to do two proofs one is simple and one is more difficult so this is how the course is organized. Are there maybe some questions so far? It's a little bit difficult for me because I really don't see any any reaction at all. Uh, can you give me some signs <laughs> that it's going OK and then there are still people in the room? We have one question. OK. Uh, we don't. <laughs> I misinterpreted no? it. We have no questions and okay. we are enjoying your talk. So please okay, go good. ahead. Thank you. Then I will continue. All right. So then uh, actually this course has it's just standard math course. It has exam, but even examination, you can really think about what do I want to do with my exam? And this is another course that I was teaching to mechanical engineering. It's also the University of Twente. It is a statistics course for mechanical engineers. And this course, um, this course, uh, these guys are third years. You know, usually this probability statistics and basic course are usually in the first year, and then I probably would have approached it differently. But these are third year students. And in the Netherlands, bachelor program is three years. So they basically almost graduates. They are almost graduating engineers. And then really they don't respond to the standard math course at the very end of their program. But then I think, OK, but what do they want to learn? And actually, I know because I asked and um, usually not always and they come back to that, but usually this comes very high. So I want to learn how to apply this knowledge in practice. And that's great because this is what I also want to teach them. But then I cannot test this really in the standard exam, because even if I apply, even if I give them as the exam some problems that sound like practice problems, it's still very distilled. The exam problems are very distilled and very precisely formulated. So actually, then I do the job of translating practical situation into mathematical problem. But I want them to do this job, you know. So that's why in this course, for example, I didn't do the standard exam. I did something else. I asked them to find their own case where statistics is applied in mechanical engineering and actually um, like make a small report about it and solve the problem. And of course, you know, um, I have to specify the volume also and uh, the coverage so that, for example, they use both probability and statistics and that their problem is interesting enough. And I have system for that, but I don't want to go into details. But basically, I ask them 
uh, I assign some small points for each and every um, little thing that we covered. Like, for example, apply by normal distribution, two points. Compute by normal probability, two points. Explain where application of normal distribution, two points. Compute something with normal distribution, two points, etc. So, and then the whole course is divided in this tiny little bits. And then I say in your assignment, you have to use at least 15 points, let's say. And then uh, I say, okay, and you have to use 15 points uh, distributed over uh, the parts of the course. And that's how I make sure that they cover everything. Not, not, not everything, but at least a reasonable amount. And then, of course, I also have quizzes and things like that. So actually, the system is similar, only at the end, uh, there is no this part, but at the end, they just do this assignment. Okay, so, you know, uh, it depends and not all assignments are great but some are really are so some cases were really nice this guy actually failed the test but he built a tiny house and made a problem about that this is about removing some uh, medical glue this is about a factory that produce feed for animals uh, this is about um, ropes for some sport they needed some ropes for some climbing or whatnot and this you would never guess what it is, I don't know. Uh, but apparently, um, when you go mountain ski during COVID, everybody had to wear a mask. And this is a little thing which is 3D printed and it is to hold your uh, medical mask um, uh, over your, your um, head or helmet when you do cross mountain ski. So this very much varied um, and it was nice to, um, to read about this. And in fact, we even published a paper about it and um, and uh, I like this system. It's not that students always like the system, but and last year didn't work really great. It really depends also a little bit on the year, but at least I believe it's meaningful. If if I want to teach them how to apply statistics in practice, then I think this is meaningful. They find some example and they formulate their problems themselves. And I think it shows better the um, knowledge um, than exam does. And also they can retry, you know, if they fail the assignment, then they, uh, they get the feedback and then they can uh, revise and resubmit. Okay, so now uh, I already told you that not everybody is always equally happy among the students um, uh, about all these innovations and uh, teachers as well. So I want to think, how do you feel? How do you think where we are on the teaching innovations? And for that, let's do the next slide. So where are we with teaching innovation? And now you can agree or disagree with the statements is that students generally like it, like they like teachers who innovate or uh, teachers who love to teach also are innovative. Um, most teachers agree that uh, we should base our teaching methods on research results and that students like innovative teaching methods. So how do you how much do you agree with these statements? I wait a little bit for a little bit more answers. And I will not ask you any more on Mintimeter. This is my last Mintimeter question today. So um, I would be really appreciative if you give me some response. Okay. Okay, moving, moving. So we are moving towards agreeing with everything. OK, uh, yes, um, you know, uh, it would be great if, if these numbers really help in practice. Uh, uh, but it really depends. I mean, the, va the variation is, is huge. Like, for example, this is not re really true. Um, many people who love to teach and really are proud of their teaching um, actually like to give lectures and for example for them uh, for them giving a lecture in a good way is a sign of good of good of good teaching and i don't say it's not because it is also important to to have like for example if you have a really great lecture and it's recorded then a lot of people can benefit from this so good lectures are really valuable i just don't believe um on actually uh, using them day to day in a day to day classroom setting, but many teachers who are actually good teachers and love to teach um, 
are actually doing it in a, in a quite a classical setting. And um, also the students mm, sometimes are not happy with innovations because their goal is to pass. So they want to pass. And when they when the course is innovative, then they're a little bit out of comfort zone. I mean, exams are also not a comfort zone because the exams are so stressful for the students. I had a student who lost seven kilo before my exam was really bad you know and he was a good student he was been, he was there all the time but he he was so stressed exam is very stressful and in fact it doesn't show much because it is basically showing whether people can reproduce material under pressure in a limited time and that is kind of a skill that nobody ever needs in real life just think about it reproducing already known things without access to information alone in a limited time in a limited type I, I, i'm not sure it says much actually but but um exam is very stressful but exam is familiar so students know if i cram for the exam and i come and i answer these familiar questions then I, I know what, what I'm doing, you know, but innovative course, if you do some strange assignment and I have to, or like some other like error uh, uh, that I can make errors and get feedback and get grades based on that, that sounds a little bit scary and unknown. So that's why students also not always equally excited. And you know, this for you scored lowest and it is correct your, your feeling about this is completely correct i'm not sure what is happening here but education sciences have very bad reputation about uh, among university teachers and it's not um completely ungrounded but it's also not so deserved i mean um educational science is moving forward and they have a lot of great insights we simply don't know about it and we don't want to know and that is really for me really puzzling because look what i'm doing as a mathematician like for example as the introduction you mentioned that sometime i was working at healthcare like with healthcare logistics so we were developing some models and we were trying to actually bring them to the hospital and um, my colleagues are very successful in this i don't do it anymore but as a mathematician when you develop some models some methods and then you try to bring them to practice then okay it's not always easy but at least practitioners uh, usually in, in any complex activity, practitioners usually are open for new research results. Think about medicine. New drug is developed, doctor apply it. A drug is proven ineffective, doctor don't, doctors don't use it anymore, right? That's normal. But there is so much research showing that classroom lectures are ineffective. And the teacher said, nah, I don't know. I think they are, you know. Okay, what about the stone of articles that show they are not? Ah, that's educational science, that's humanities. They don't know nothing about teaching mathematics. That is, none of this is true, you know? And okay, I know there is a lot of bad educational science, like there is a lot of mediocre mathematics, but but after some distilling through this uh, implementation process, yeah, we should apply research. Like we are working at scientific institution and we actively deny the science about our core activity, which is education. I really don't understand that. So this is really, your feeling here is right, that this is like the least um, successful point of all. Yeah, and the world students I already mentioned before. So so, so we are actually, so uh, innovation in teaching meets a lot of resistance. So let me go back to my, to my slides. And there are articles about that as well. So this is a very good article measuring actual learning versus feeling of learning it's also one of the problems also that students don't really know when they learn well so this uh was two forms so um the the gray bars are traditional lecture and the dark bars are um more interactive like more or less what i do like there are quiz there is a question and students try to answer it and then they discuss it at groups and then teacher explains more or less what i do in my class so you see when you ask students about this they say oh i enjoyed this so much i learned a great deal instructor was effective i wish all my classes were like this and traditional lecture wins everywhere everywhere except these are the test results so students also, it's not that the students do not know how they learn, that is also too strong a statement, but in general, human beings are famously terrible in evaluating our own cognition, 
and the students there is even more like for example if i explain something very clearly very nicely like have prepared this explanation very well and they could follow they confuse their own fluency and my fluency. They believe if I could explain it, they could, could explain, but it's just not true. It's simply not true. Second of all, they are new to the subject. So this, besides the fact that humans cannot evaluate their, their cognitive activity very well anyway, they also have to evaluate their cognitive activity on a topic that they don't know. So, so it's very hard for them to realize how much they really learned without knowing the subject. And also, um, learning actively means struggle. You only learn something when you struggle, when you fail, and when you try again. But when students, especially good students who come to university after being very nice, good in math at school, and they come to university and they start struggling, they see this struggle as a sign of failure. They see this struggle as a sign that they are not moving anywhere. You know, but actually, they learn exactly when they struggle, but they don't have such feeling. They have a feeling that they learn if I tell them a nice story. This is when they feel they learn, but it's just not correct. So our brain plays a mean joke with us all the time, and definitely with students at a difficult course. Their brain, and their brain, by the way, is still growing. They are not even mature brain. The human brain grows till 25. So it's right to ask students how they experience the course, but it's not right to ask students how we should teach this course effectively, because they really don't know. And then, you know, if you start doing all these innovations, um, well, I didn't put it on the slide. I should have. Like, uh, if I go back to my this linear algebra course, uh, la la la, I have to go. Yeah, okay. Here we were. Yeah. So, how much do we have to prepare? We have to make videos. We have to make nice learning. Uh, this uh, LMS, this uh, canvas we use this for students with all the information. I have to prepare these questions with one software. I have to prepare. We have to prepare these questions with another software. Here we have a huge bank of questions, like. Uh, I don't know, we jungle 10 different digital tools in this one course, you know, so so it's not easy and also a lot of it I don't know. Like, for example, website should be designed well for the students, but I don't know how to do it. And here with videos, I also needed help. So so if a teacher, so the, the modern course is not a course like there is a book and they teach it, you know, the modern course is a multimedia project. That's the way I see it. And you cannot ask a mathematician with PhD, who, by the way, is supposed to actually do research in mathematics and write grants and write articles and present a conference to the peers, you know, you cannot expect a person uh, who's serious doing research, you can't expect a person to be an expert in all this web design and video making and, and pedagogical tools and how, like, which learning methods are effective. You cannot expect everybody to, to read all this literature in their free time because I, I'm just, okay, this is my, they say, my passion, my goal, my hobby, name it what you like. But not everybody should be even like me. Like we have a lot of tasks in academia and all these tasks have to be performed. So you cannot expect from everybody to set up a multimedia project like this. Definitely not without help. And that's why I have this idea uh, that um, because the course is a uh, my apologies for the flipping through the flight, but this is basically what I wanted to explain. So the 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 course, the modern course, requires a lot of expertise. Of course, you need expertise in content. So a person with PhD in math can be, be an expert in the content of a math course, right? But there are so many other things. How to teach the course effectively so that students really learn, and how to handle all this online tools that will support the learning and all this design and all this presentation for the students and all this like peer reviews, whatnot. But also there is an administration because if courses is multimedia project and students have a lot of activities, all these activities have to be somehow accounted for and, and taken track. I mean, nowadays with all these online tools, we can individually see whatever each student is doing, but I don't have time for that, you know? Somebody should do this and summarize this and keep a track of this, you know? And one teacher just cannot do it alone. That's why I believe that in the future we should strive for a system more like that. 
I am a mathematician. I am responsible for the content. I am responsible for the great content. I am responsible for good explanation. That is my main responsibility. In that sense, I agree with you that for the teacher, that is my teaching qualifications. But I do need support about like somebody should know about what are the recent research results about education and how to put them in practice. And it does need to be me. It can be somebody else who can advise me or not advise, but who designed that course for me because course design is important. You also agreed on that. And juggling all these tools is very hard. So it, I prefer if somebody sets it up for me. So if I if, for example, if I say, OK, this is a great course design and then some person just just does all this, you know, implements all this so that all these crises work and, you know, um, and uh, all these links work and uh, and all these tools are used correctly. And if students have questions about these tools that they can ask this person, not me, because I don't know this. And also, of course, support is needed for administration and that could be student assistance as well. But if a teacher, a teacher simply cannot do this. That is, we are not qualified even for this. That is the point. OK, so and then um, one other problem with this teaching innovation that and that I'm now coming closer to, to the talk and now I, I'm coming to this part. I'm, it's really a pity that I could cannot see your faces. So my innovations, they are not always going smoothly. And there is one thing that I really struggle with, and that is grading. So in fact, you know, my statistics course this year didn't go that great as before. It was a difficult group of students also, because this was a students who the year was um, COVID year. So they don't have any social coherence. And having social co coherence in the group is very important for learning. Um, but um, basically, I usually ask these questions and usually I have this option that, OK, I don't care what I learn, I just want to pass. And usually this option ends up reasonably high for any course, which is already alarming. This year is by far outnumbered. Like they have to distribute, each student have to distribute 100 points among all these goals. And um, this option really won by far. And I was, it was very demotivating for me, to be very honest. I really didn't know what to do with this. So as a teacher, you know, I want to see myself as an expert who guides them, who explains them, who can mentor them, who can have some impact on their career, you know, all these things like, OK, I'm a teacher, I'm a mentor, I'm an expert. Uh, I'm um, one of them in the same academic community. But it's not the way they see me. That's not the way they see me. Uh, when I look at this, I think the way they see me is this. is like a sphinx. It is a sphinx. So a sphinx is like a very ancient and scary creature who gives you weird riddles. And if you do not get the riddles right, it will just eat you up. You know, that's the legend of the sphinx. And um, that's very sad because I don't want to see myself like this, but I'm I'm realistic enough to to see what's going on. Like students are so much grade driven and the moment they're grade driven. Very hard to whatever I do in the class, if at the end they get a grade that already makes them grade driven. So that's really on my way and I struggled with it quite a bit. And then last time I discovered this book and now I have a hope, although now I explained to some colleagues about these ideas and um, and uh, they immediately say, oh, these ideas will fail miserably in, in this group. Like, OK, I don't know. But again, it's based on research and based on lots of experience. And um, there are many ways. So it's about alternative, so-called alternative grading. Apparently, there is such thing, and I didn't know, which is called alternative grading. And there are many ways of doing this. But the idea, the underlying idea is the same. And the underlying idea you will love because it's complex systems, right? The underlying idea is feedback loop. So basically the students something, gets feedback, and the feedback is, OK, you have mastered this part, or no, not yet. You haven't yet mastered this part. And what you did wrong is this, this, this. And then student try again, tries again, and comes back. And basically, for example, for a math course, you can define some standards. For example, one standard, OK, a student is able to, uh, like a student can understand normal distribution, for example. 
And that would be one standard. And another one, a student can apply central limit theorem, for example. And then I define, say, 20 such standards. And for each standard, student tries to do some work and show it to me. And I say, OK, that's great. My normal distribution now you know. And uh, otherwise, I say, no, not yet. And at the end, out of 20 points, out of this 20 uh, little standards, they call them standards, we see how many the students could master. And there are always several attempts for all of them. So it makes everything low stake. And basically, it's much more natural. It's much more rhyming with the way human beings learn, uh, because we learn by trying, making mistakes seeing our mistakes and trying again. Actually, machine learning is also does that, right? But machine learning is not punished. They just compute the penalty score and try again. So that is more or less what is happening here. And from the teacher perspective, it's much easier because it's really difficult to parse these points, you know, like, is it a six or is it a seven? Is it 95 percent or is it 93 percent or is it 56 percent or 57 percent, you know? But this one, this system takes it completely away because you can just say, OK, uh, I think you 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 managed this topic or you didn't manage this topic, you know, and that is reasonably easy to say. And then instead of saying, uh, usually students after exam come up complaining, why do I get here three points and not five, you know? But here, there is, this question is taken away and instead students come and ask, okay, I seem to struggle with this topic, so I'm trying to do this and this and what am I doing wrong, you know? So they start more interested in the material. At least this is experience of all people who tried that system. And another important thing is community. So uh, we need to be community with students. They should not see us as gatekeepers, as Sphinx on, on the way to their degree. They should really see us as somebody who is one of them, that that academic community feeling used to be there when student groups were small. Now higher education is really huge and it is not going to reduce. So we have to think about how can we create this community feeling in this new atmosphere so that students and we are like together in this, you know, with one common goal to make students learn as well as possible. So this community feeling is needed for this alternative grading because students need to trust the teacher because otherwise this feedback loop will not be broken. And of course, since they have to try and try and try again and we don't want them to cheat, um, at the end they get great anyway, so uh, cheating can occur, of course. We need a huge number of questions and again, teacher cannot do it alone. So you need quite some investment into setting up system like this because you need a huge exam box. Not exam banks, but huge amount of question on which students can show their qualifications, basically. So this is, but OK, I will not talk, talk about it in detail, but this is an interesting system. And uh, OK, let's uh, end up with, OK, so what, what's the future, future of higher education um, holds for us? And there is this famous person, you can check him out. He's called Scott Galloway. He's very interesting. He's uh, a professor in uh, business and he's a serial entrepreneur. He, um, uh, is, um, he actually donates his entire salary to university because his companies are so successful. Um, and um, he is making quite somber prediction for the future of higher education. He basically says that um, we have increased prices um, by, mm, uh, um, say, that's not correct, can't be right. Uh, we have increased prices like 140, no, no, yeah, that's correct. So 14 times, basically, we increased prices 14 times since 70s, but the product has not appreciably changed. And that is where, in, where he says this is where disruption occurs like think about mm, telecommunications things think about medicine for example telecommunications is the best example um that telecommunication is uncomparable now as compared to 70s but the prices are cheaper we used to call we used to call for internationally it was really expensive in the 70s now it's free via whatsapp right so so that is a sector with a lot of innovations but in education they say prices are rising and nothing happens so it's a section a sector for disruption however he himself also says like that really like whether our product changed or not depends what our product is and he himself says that actually education is not our only product he says our product is certification education and experience and i believe this can be refined a little bit because education is a little bit too general. I mean, I have read too much about it to just accept this one label. So I refine it a little bit like this. So I say education can be split 
in two things. One is curriculum, the, prog the program, like what we are going to teach, and another is how we teach it, where the students learn effectively. And I would say that out of these four pro products, certification, curriculum, effective learning and experience, three we do really great. And they actually did improve a lot since 70s because our certification is really under control and industry trusts our degrees. So we do that part well. Our, our degrees are still valued by our stakeholders. Curriculum, we are doing great because we create a lot of new curricula, such as biomedical technology, you name it, but also even math curriculum, computer science curriculum is reconsidered all the time, revised all the time. So we are doing it great. Nobody will do it better than us because we are very well positioned. We know what industry wants. We know the, the forefront research. We know we, we um, talk to the students. So we are very well positioned to, to do that. And nobody else will, can do it actually as well as we do. And experience is great. I mean, the, the experience is not only your friendships, experience is also labs and access to the teachers and all the facilities that the university offers. And that is also great. However, if I have to be very honest, we are really, really bad in, in this last one. We are really, really bad. Simply, um, simply because people are so bad in cognition and because education sciences penetrate so slowly into university, then we all have illusion that we are doing very well. We uh, teachers say, oh, I'm so enthusiastic, I explain so well, so I teach very well. And students say, oh, the teacher is so enthusiastic, they explain so well, so we are learning so well. But basically, this are kind of, it's not uncorrelated factors, but it's really not the only, and it's really the smallest factor in the learning. Um, so, so basically, we don't do it very well, and we have illusion that we do, and and um, and um, that is very hard to 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 overcome. Uh, but I can promise to you that I will keep trying, and uh, I'm not giving up. I have still 17 years to pension, and I hope to achieve some progress in the 17 years. I will just look at this item all the time. I put big magnifying glass on this, and I will keep working on it. And I'm not giving up. And um, if you want to join that that uh, endeavor, then um, I will invest all the in time and effort that I possibly can to um, uh, to do this together. And I guess that was my slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Now let me maybe open um, the team so that I can see you. We had an applause, but I think you didn't hear it. No. I Thank didn't. you very much for this amazing, eye-opening talk and honestly inspiring. I know I, for one, am more inspired to teach than I was before I heard this talk. Um, Thank you. I am really curious. Uh, do the students approach you to give you feedback? about this so to me this sounds like an amazing learning experience i would be very happy if i had a course like that what is your experience on this yeah so as you see thank you for this question as you see i got all this teaching awards so it is appreciated it's not that it's not appreciated and um i sometimes i even get feedback like for the statistics assignment there was this assignment written in a pencil and um, the student did a good job and then the student said i want to write a personal note for you you know i'm coming from a family where everybody learns statistics my both parents learn statistics and my brother learns statistics and i was prepared to come and digest a huge number of meaningless formulas that i have to apply somehow um, and that is, I believe, what statistic was about. And it was so much different. He said, really, I ended up really curious about how to apply, which method to apply when. And uh, I enjoyed the course and I really didn't expect it. So this, um, uh, this it was from female student, so she, she thanked me for that. And uh, I get thanks for the videos a lot even from all over the world. Sometimes I get in messages on YouTube from Africa or Asia um, that thank you finally due to your videos I could understand this book, you know. Um, yeah, so I get I get a lot of positive feedback. I also get complaints um, that the grading system was bad. I, I, I get some like uh, replacing exam by the assignment was the worst idea ever and this type of things. 
um, I also learned um, some things that I still should not do, even it's very tempting. You know, in some sense, I'm a little bit too fast in applying new things. Like, for example, I read a book and say, oh, that's a great idea, let's do it. But I'm already teaching this, that course. But next, no, now this book says the students should work in group of three. I have 100 students, let's divide them in group of three. And then it's a whole mess. And students are not very forgiven, forgiven for this, and rightfully so, because they come to the course with some mindset and some, okay, already they, they are in the system. And I have to respect that I cannot change the way I work, like in a course of 400 students, right, on the fly, you know. Um, so, so sometimes I do too much as well. Um, but I must say that sometimes, so I get, uh, I don't believe in student evaluations, by the way. It, there is a lot of research saying that students' evaluation, this anonymous evaluation, are gender biased and actually are not very correlated with quality of education for some reasons that I even showed to you today because students do not completely understand their learning. Um, but I get a lot of very useful feedback from students in a different setting, like from the conversations with students, I get a lot of very useful feedback. And why? Because I can ask questions and I can ask further. For example, um, remember these little dots in the videos when video stops and there is a question popping up? So at the beginning, um, so these questions actually I had in the videos as well, and then student assistant inserted them in the videos. And, um, and uh, we were very enthusiastic about these interactive videos. And then I asked students and turned out almost nobody was answering these questions. And I was wondering like, why? So I asked one, one girl who said, no, I don't like them. I say, but why don't you like them? They're so useful. She said, I don't like when they ask me about what I don't know yet. I say, what? I mean, these questions never ask this. But usually when students say something, you cannot be dismissive. That's first of all, student puts themselves in a very vulnerable situation when they give you feedback uh, because you have an authority and they depend on you in some way. So it is courageous from them to give you a critical feedback and um, there is always something to it. So you really cannot be dismissive. That's not right. So I started thinking, what does she mean? And then I realized, OK, uh, for example, I give a small part of a proof, OK? I say, okay, part A, I'm proving like this. And then my open question was, how do you now prove part B? And of course, she has an impression that I'm asking her something she doesn't know yet. So I realized that open question is a problem because that creates her own impression. So I asked this someone, the student assistant again, and she again poured like hours and hours of work. And she converted all these questions in multiple choice and numerical answer and drag and drop. And after that, students started finding them very useful. So, uh, so students' feedback is very important. Um, like, why did I record videos about statistics? Because students stopped coming to the lectures. I thought first my lectures were not good enough, so I improved the lectures, but they didn't come into the first lecture. You know, out of 150 students, 30 will show up for a lecture, so 150 for exam. I thought, okay, what am I doing here, you know? And then I felt myself really like a sphinx. And then I thought, okay, they don't come to me, I will come to you. And then I started recording these videos. And you know when I did it? I did it in the fall 2019. And I was spending so much time on these videos in the studio, the statistics videos, um, that my colleagues were saying, you're spending so much time. Are you crazy? Now, and then in March 2020, we all went on lockdown. And who is crazy now? So, so, you know, it's like, um, but I start this huge indoors based on what some students say or based on how they behave. And I rarely started something big based on what I, for example, read in anonymous evaluations. So that is a little bit long and maybe, maybe over the top an answer to your, to your question, but it was a very important question. Thank you very much for your response. We have approximately half an hour for questions left. So does anybody else want to ask something? Yeah, we have one question. Hi, um, thank Hi. you for a really nice talk. Um, I was wondering, because um, 
I know that in the Netherlands it's very uh, common that professors also have to teach courses. Um, but I know from my own research group that the professors they they like to teach, but a lot of the subjects they feel like well, it's very easy for them. So teaching is not really, really a priority for them. Well, I know that in the States, for instance, you have professors that only teach and you have professors that only do research. Do you think that would be a better option like that? Because that would mean that the teachers focus only on the teaching rather than viewing it more as, more as a site job, basically. Thank you. That's, that's like fantastic questions, very deep questions too. So. Personally, I really love both. I um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not maybe the, the most famous researcher in the world, but I, I find myself reasonably a performing a researcher, let's say. So, um, so I wouldn't personally give up on any of the two, even though I made education my life mission, honestly, and actually it is a relief to honestly say about this and the environment which is so much research driven. Okay, uh, so um, your question is very deep because academic job involves a lot of things. So there is teaching, there is research, but there are a lot of other things, serving community, administrative tasks, you name it. So in the Netherlands, there is this new movement which didn't take off in the form they wanted, in the form they, they invented it, let's say. But I like the original idea and I hope one day we will get there. So the idea is that in academia, you have basically four most important tasks. One is doing research, one is education, one is leadership, and one is um, valorization. Right. And these four tasks, they require completely different skills and completely different per, like personal qualities. And um, academia, mm, like at the beginning and the inception of academia, of course, it was all much easy because it was not such a huge scale. So a person could combine it all, but also the requirements, the benchmark for leadership skills and teaching skills was much lower. Like um, it's like it was and groups were much smaller. So it's really it's really it really changed a lot. So now this sector is massive. Academia is a massive sector. We should really stop thinking about ourselves as a selected club of geniuses. We really are not. We are huge industry. We are huge industry, which is charged by society with the task of generating and disseminating knowledge. And uh, that is an important task in the knowledge driven society. We need high qualifications for doing this task, but but this these are high qualifications, but these are qualifications. So it's not, of course, you need like what we call talent, but guess what? You need it for everything. You do you think you don't need a, a talent for shooting a movie? I mean, come on. We shouldn't be so snobbish about what we do. It's not that exclusive. So we are running this knowledge generating and disseminating machine, and we have different tasks in it. So um, there used to be a time when a person could be great and everything, but these times are gone. But the benchmark in all the four tasks are too high for one person to achieve all four. It is possible. I don't say such people don't exist, but it is an exception. So the idea of this light of this um, uh, set of uh, for this movement, which is called recognition and rewards, is that a person should be allowed to focus on some of these tasks and should be allowed to perform like on average or not at all uh, for the others. And, um, um, and uh, I support that. I'm a big supporter of that. And for myself, I would see, I would, I, and you can do different tasks on different levels. And for example, the easiest to explain on research. So the research, you could be like, you could be a world leader in your area. You could be a very strong researcher in, in your area who gets invited to the talks and publishing in good journals, but not the, the world defining like person. Okay. 
and you can be uh, even not that you could publish just a couple of papers per like like you can just not publish like uh, at, at all or very little only supervised students you know so in research you you clearly see this type of different levels on which it also depends a lot how much time you spend on it because more time you spend on research more successful you are there is no other secret time is still finite okay so um yeah, so, so with teaching, it's much more difficult to define. But the general the general definition of this level of performance would be like, OK, uh, for example, I teach my course and students uh, pass this course, and that is the basic level. The next level would be that I base my teaching methods on scientific research. I disseminate this. I uh, the way, what I do in teaching influences the colleagues around me. Or what I do in teaching influences my organization, or what I do in teaching uh, is already influencing on national or international level, you know. So that is teaching uh, performance. So like like similar like research performance, like the research that you do, it helps your group, or it is recognized nationally, internationally, or you are world uh, world star, you know. Uh, so. So similar levels you can define on anything. And I believe that a person can perform reasonably high on two, and basically that's it. So um, uh, so I believe in this type of things. So it is OK if, um, if somebody is very much research oriented. It is OK if they just teach one course per year, which is based on their research specialty, so that they can make, um, basically, they can start breeding new researchers in this area. It's OK. What I don't like is that they say that basic courses are too easy for them to teach. So I have a daughter who has um, a, some kind of form of learning disability, and uh, she's she's fine. She's studying to be <laughs> somebody who shoots videos, but um, but uh, she has really problems with math, like real big problems with math. I can tell you, I have been teaching in summer schools for PhD students. I have been teaching forefront research material. I never had more difficult task than teaching how to compute an area of a rectangular to my daughter. It is not that the easier material, the more difficult, uh, the easier it is to teach it. It's almost the other way around. When you teach to PhD students or to master students of the topic they're interested in, you have very motivated audience. You don't even need much. You can even do classroom lectures. They will write with you. They will record you yourself. They will come to you with questions. So you don't need to do much pedagogy wise, you know, but uh, it's enough to be inspiring and to be great, you know, in, in what you do in, in your research, basically to know the content and content. So basically this content part becomes very important in this highly loaded research based courses. But if you teach calculus that is taught to millions of students every year, maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands. Um, that is a big group. That is a material that everybody has to master. And that is more difficult teaching in terms of teaching that is more difficult. So I do not like when like top researcher who basically sucks in this type of things says, oh, it's too easy for me. No. It's not too easy for you. It's simply different, different sport. It is just different activity, different activity in which you possibly not excel. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. So that's why uh, I and I believe we have to be more upfront about it. We shouldn't ascribe like if somebody is a great researcher, we shouldn't immediately ascribe. Oh, then it means this person is also a great teacher. She, he just maybe doesn't want to teach and the person must be also a great leader and a great in valorization. It's not true. It's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true. And there are a lot of examples of really great mathematicians who basically were only great in that. And we're not good leaders and not good teachers and did nothing with valorization at all. And it's also OK if you are on that level in math. And why not? You know, so we should be more accepting about different profiles, but also more respecting for different profiles. It's very easy for me to say, oh, this research is like really, wow, I'm amazed by this research. It's very easy for me to say. But then why is it so difficult for some people to say, wow, how can you teach a calculus course for 200 students and they're also enthusiastic? This needs a little bit more respect. That's what I believe. 
great, thanks. <laughs> My answers are really long, but that's because I don't know how many questions will be there. <laughs> I can give also short answers, by the way, if if you um, if you want. Uh, I have another question. Um, so, especially starting from what you said uh, right at the end, um, now. Um, so, yes, it's true. Many mathematicians or other uh, researchers are not really great at teaching. So, I wanted to ask you what do you think about having teachers who only do teaching in university and researchers who just do research? Because, I mean, if you're good at something, you should just do that. Why imposing to do four different things, as you said before, and maybe not do any all of these things great because you don't have the time and you don't have the staff, administrative staff that can help you doing all of the other things that you said before. So you cannot even do this better teaching as you were explaining because you don't have the time. True, or, I'm, and I'm fine with that. Skills. I'm fine. I'm fine with that. So I believe that, uh, and we do have actually in the Netherlands and in the US, they also do. We do have staff who only teaches. The problem with this that it used to be like demotion. Like, okay, everybody is hired as assistant professor, and then if your research doesn't go great, then you basically then you only teach. That's what was happening, and that I think is not right. I believe that um, teaching should uh, be on a par with research in terms that there should be career in teaching. There should be also clear, clear um, signs of excellence in teaching, like clear criteria of excellence in teaching. There should be also recognition that uh, this excellence is not easily achieved because this is true um so this um i i, I think that universities should hire full-time lecturers and uh, these full-time lecturers should then excel in teaching excel in terms that they should be aware of new trends and research they should be open uh, to that they should be standing behind these innovative initiatives and they should have career perspectives and they should get respect it should not be a dead end as is often is, and that is the problem. The problem is not full time teaching. The problem is that at that end, uh, career wise. OK, so what about full time research? I also agree that if somebody is doing completely brilliant research, then loading them with even courses for bachelor or beginning master students on their topic is not the right thing to do. I think if somebody really is research oriented, should teach, but probably should be given an opportunity to teach something very specialized, very top notch to interested to interested audience of high level, like a master elective or PhD student course, for, uh, which may be also ac ac um, accessible for master students. Because uh, as I said, on this level, pedagogy is not so important anymore. And that level really um, getting things explained right from like you know uh, so like um coming back to explanation like for example calculus invented like um, 300 years ago by now uh, they explained so well in so many ways with such great animations and all that you really cannot improve on that it's really hard to improve on that but if you are talking about if you're teaching top-notch re research then this stuff that you're teaching are still in papers and papers, are they are not so distilled. They are more difficult to read. They are more easily read to people who really are in that area. And then it penetrates. Look, calculus also used to be like top-notch research 300 years ago, right? But now, uh, after reflection, after reflection, reflection, and book, and book, and book, and book, now we basically broke it down to pieces that we can explain in high school, you know? Um, so uh, similar happens with any research. A research that is done now maybe will be in textbooks in, in uh, 50 years, you know, but now it's not yet. Now it's in papers and not everybody can read papers, but top, but researchers can. So, so in that sense, even retelling in an accessible way what different papers are saying about a new field is extremely valuable. And this is what these people will like to do. And pedagogy is not that important because then these people come really to hear that story, to hear that that overview. That and these people are motivated. Uh, that they are they are prepared. They will not cheat on the assignment, you know. 
So it's a completely different game. And I believe that if you're a research at university, that that is a game that you should play. Because um, uh, we are there to generate and disseminate knowledge and um, disseminate into younger generation and breeding our own, like breeding new generation of researchers is our direct task. And I think top researchers definitely are interested in that, most of them at least, uh, some not, but most of them are. And I think they should be given an opportunity or, um, yeah, they should do that. I think that, sh but it's like teaching which is much more connected to research. So I think they will be also more motivated for that. But I think a top researcher who doesn't like teaching, is not effective in teaching, should be allowed to teach only one course per year related to his or her own um, field and make this really meaningful for the interested students. For them, it will be like a party. It will be like really a celebration to come to that course. That would be the setting. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. I can see you too. <laughs> so I, I would like to well, I would like to thank you for the very beautiful talk, uh, very enlightening. And I, I would like to ask you, at what point do you think that a student makes a transition between actually needing all those materials and that nice pedagogy and everything to be able to follow a course given by a top-notch researcher and not needing any more all those kind of materials? Well, at what point does this change for our students? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. So um, I believe I will try now for the difference to give a shorter answer. So um, like when we teach students, we don't own, only teach them material. We also teach them how to work with that material. Um, so that is a part of it. It's not uh, like it's basically it's in it's going through in every course, but no, unfortunately not every course makes it explicit. But for example, when when in this uh, scheme that I showed, we really make it explicit. Like we really um, like here, for example, which they just learn material, do I understand what linear space is? But here we really ask them to write and reflect on it, and basically we are learning the learning them to be mathematicians. OK, teaching them to be mathematicians. So from course to course, if they master the skills con um, like consistently, they become better. This. So in fact, you know, it is really hard for me, like how to evaluate their proofs? Because to be honest, OK, they're done with the first part of linear algebra, but they're really not done in, in learning how to do proofs. It's really only the very first step that they are making. But at some point, they will improve at that. So, and uh, and that will make them more professional. So with every year they become more professional. So at some point they gradually achieve a sufficient level of professionalism to be completely self-motivated and also not needing this type of um, uh, pedagogical guidance because uh, they are they are self motivated and they also know how to do it. It's also learning how to learn is another thing, right? So at that point. You do not have to give them uh, forced spacing on them because they already know that they have to do spacing, that they have to learn in small chunks uh, regularly, for example. So, so uh, I would say the change is gradual, and you should um, offer them courses that are like, like old-fashioned, I can say, but this type of courses which basically tells them a story and they have to make something out of it when when they are. Because like at some level as you and I, like when we go to conferences, we listen to talks, right? We learn something from these talks. Uh, to be honest, sometimes I find it very difficult to listen to them. But uh, but uh, at least it is an acceptable form because, right, people people summarize something new and uh, it is for you the cheapest way to get some exposure to that. So they should achieve that level. But even then, for example, assume I teach them random graphs and I want to teach them some very new technique in random graphs. If I just want to tell guys, look, there is this cool new technique, that's one thing. But if I want them really to teach how to apply that technique, then they have to work with this technique. And then we are going back to this pedagogy. Maybe the course will be organized differently. Maybe I will ask them to write a paper about it, for example, or um, just give them some unknown problem and see what they figure it out. But they have to do hands on. And in PhD as well, you go hands on. That's how you learn. That's how you learn the tools that you use in PhD, right? Right. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So. I have one more question. At one point, you pointed out that there are a lot of students who struggle when they struggle with learning because they're used to just figuring everything out immediately and they get very frustrated when they encounter obstacles. So I'm curious, what is your advice to somebody who struggles with something like that, asking for a friend? Yeah, so I think it is important that we have an environment where we we celebrate the struggle, where we uh, we can say, uh, like you know, once I showed this quiz question, and uh, everybody answered correctly. So we discussed something similar before, and then I showed this question, and students knew, and they all answered correctly. And I looked at this and say, oh, that's too bad. Nobody learned anything from this question. You know, so you have to create an environment where, uh, as a teacher, you should never say, oh, that's wrong, because that's really offsetting for the stu for a student. You really have to say, wow, this is great that you are going through this, that you are trying, that you are struggling, that, like, to be honest, when you do your research, don't you struggle? I mean, isn't it like the best part of it? So they have to learn also to embrace that. I also tell them, but you know, it really doesn't matter what you tell. I mean, it really does, doesn't matter that much. I mean, I, I stopped assigning such big significance to my own words, you know. These are young, bright people. Yeah, but doesn't matter what I say. But sometimes you say something that, that makes some impression um, when it's like the right moment. So sometimes I tell them also like, look, it's supposed to be difficult. Otherwise, what are you doing here, you know? Uh, if everything is easy it has to be very suspicious because that means that anybody with your similar abilities as you are can take your job for example if you struggle that means you learn something valuable and that is really the sign of learning that is we should just keep repeating repeating unfortunately it completely disappeared from that culture the culture is also like this okay if you can easily make a test then you are good if you if you can quickly answer the question that you're good no it doesn't mean some people think slowly that's fine let them think slowly. I don't care. Because in real life, they will have you always a chance to think. So, yeah. Um, so we should make struggle more normal. We should also be more open about how we struggle. This perfect story of only successes just is not true. And students also should understand the reality of life. We have to teach them how to like it. Thank you very much, Nelly, and thank you very much for this talk and all the insights and wisdom that you shared with us today. We are very grateful. We will give you an applause. I'm not sure if you will hear it. I don't, but thank you. I see it. I see it. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, if you want to team up on this uh, topics, then just uh, you know how to find me. Okay. Bye. Have a good conference. Bye bye.